Good evening. Uh, one of the advantages I always thought of giving lectures about the history of the subject is that you don't have to revise them. Uh, but I was recently in contact with somebody whose name will come up during this, Jim King, uh, and I had to revise this reasonably significantly for this talk. So this is a paper that was published 10 years ago but has now been revised. What I would like to do is to try and make sense of this cloud of names. So some of the names you'll recognize, uh, people like McCarthy, um, Peter Nauer, uh, Peter Landin, Robin Milner, and Tony Hall must be there somewhere, yeah, over there. Those names you probably recognize already, but there are probably some less familiar names there, uh, Gorn, Perlis, um, and Jim King, who I just mentioned. And I'd like to try and weave these names together and explain how we've got to where we are today, or rather, how we got to, at a critical point, on program verification ideas. So, my plan is to focus on proofs of sequential programs. I could give a, an almost as long talk, possibly as long, on concurrency, uh, and I could talk about the design of uh, support tools, program verification tools. But the majority of the talk to this evening will be on proofs about sequential programs rather than concurrent programs, because this came first. Uh, and if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at the moment, uh, I and a PhD student, on the history of semantics of programming languages. So the grayed out ones are the ones I'm not going to talk about this evening. The message uh, is actually an interesting message. Um, some people think the idea of verifying programs has come along recently and there's a group of mathematicians trying to push their wares onto computer people. Uh, it's not true. The, the work on program verification was there with the very founders of our subject. And what we've really been trying to do all of the time since is to find tractable, uh, reasonably easy to use ways to verify programs. So I don't think proofs of programs is a completely new topic. I want to illustrate that it's a much older topic and we've been developing it. So an absolute central point in this, uh, somebody who was important to both Kevin and I's uh, careers, is a paper by Tony Hoare. Uh, these references are all expanded at the end of the lecture. So Hoare 69 is Tony Hoare's 1969 paper entitled An Axiomatic Basis of Computer Programming. This paper is widely cited and reasonably widely read. Uh, and I'll make that distinction clearer when we get to another paper later on. But it's a very useful reference point. And what I want to do this evening is to use it as a sort of fulcrum or balancing point um, and look at the things which went on before Hoare's paper and after Hoare's paper. And we'll go backwards first and then move forwards afterwards. Uh, Hoare's paper is certainly not the beginning which Hoare concedes. So, uh, this is a nice small informal audience. How many people already know Hoare's axiomatic method? Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> no, right, okay. Let's take this a bit slowly then. So, H Tony Hoare introduced a system which he actually wrote the two assertions uh, without braces and wrote braces around the program in the middle. That is not the way most people remember Hoare's method. Now, uh, the assertions, the pre and post condition, are written uh, in braces around the program. And I'm not going to go through in detail this derivation because we'll look at it when we come to Bob Floyd's work. But intuitively you would expect that if x equals r plus q times y before you execute these two statements and you add 1 to q, which increases this side, but you take uh, y away from r, you would expect this sum to stay the same. So this precondition, x equals r plus q times y, is preserved, is actually an invariant across these two assignments. I say informally because I'll show you the formal rule for that later. <coughs> 
Um, and if you want to keep the numbers positive, then you need to know that y is at least, uh, uh, sorry, r is at least as large as y before you do this subtraction. So originally Hoare uh, wrote it this way. The world now always thinks Hoare axioms are written this way, and we'll discuss the assignment in a moment. Hoare has a formal rule for that. Much more interesting is the formal rule for while loops. So what was observed, uh, not initially by Hoare, but recorded in this way by Hoare, is that if you've got an assertion P, which is invariant across statement S, so P as a precondition for S still keeps the assertion P true after you've executed S, then if you start a whole while loop, which has while B do S, and P is true beforehand, you can execute S zero times, in which case P is true afterwards, or many times. But by this uh, assumption, then P is still true after however many times you execute it. Furthermore, when you do this proof up here, you can assume that the test uh, of the loop is true, because you won't be executing S unless B is true. And once the loop finishes, if it finishes, uh, you can assume that B is false after the loop. So the whole meaning of a while loop can be crystallized into this very simple Hoare axiom, or floyd Hoare axiom. If, if we know P and B is true as a sufficient condition for S to give us P, then if we know P is true before this while loop, then we know this condition afterwards. Uh, I'm going to make an issue of the people who do and do not reason about program termination. Tony Hoare's system actually doesn't prove the loop terminates. It says, if the loop terminates, this condition will be true. And John McCarthy had a rather wicked uh, way of dismissing this approach of not handling termination. John McCarthy said, if you want to become a millionaire, it's very easy. You walk down the street and you pick up the first piece of paper you see. If it's a check made out to you for a million dollars, you go to the bank. If it isn't, you throw it away and carry on. That's the same problem as termination. You don't know you're ever going to terminate, so you may never become a millionaire. And Hoare's axioms do not actually deal with termination and we'll make a distinction about that uh, in a moment. But now, given what we had on the previous slide about S, where S is R gets R minus Y and Q gets Q plus 1, we can now conclude that if X equals R plus Q times Y before this, then it will be true afterwards. And what we're developing is a simple division algorithm, but a division done by s successive subtraction. So. Hoare is using an example, which actually is the same example that Floyd used, uh, to develop this program, which says, under all conditions, uh, actually, if all of the variables are the right type, but under all conditions, so under true, this program will develop uh, a result R, which is x equals R plus Q times Y. So R is now a remainder, because R has been reduced to a value less than y. So we're dividing x by y, we get r as a remainder, um, and we've counted in q how many times the subtraction could be made. So how do we prove this with a Hoare axiom? Well, here's a rule with two hypotheses. It says if, if s takes us from p to q, and t takes us from q to r, then s followed by t will take us from this precondition through this intermediate condition to this final condition. So we can now put some initialization on the front and put the whole of uh, the value x, which we're going to divide into, into variable r, and initialize the quotient to 0. And if we do that, then we have indeed developed a program which gives us division by successive subtraction. Um, Somebody in the audience ought to be worried whether this, this is really a proof that this program does exactly what we want it to. Um, we have not, in fact, 
said that the original values of x and y are not changed here. So Hoare's uh, idea that post conditions, the things after the statements, are predicates of a single state is really rather weak. We would like to be able to say that this gives us the division of the initial value of x by the initial value of y. And uh, work that followed actually developed the idea of using relations rather than simple predicates as the post conditions. Um, but that comes after Hoare, so I should really postpone that point. Okay, I've said uh, Hoare's uh, axioms are a very useful reference point, 1969, but they're certainly not the starting point. Uh, and immediately before Hoare, there were important papers by Floyd, Nauer, and Van Weingarten, as we'll see in a moment. Um, here is Floyd's uh, a famous paper, Assigning Meaning to Programs, exactly the same problem. Uh, notice Floyd writes his annotations on a flowchart. So he says, this is the flowchart of my code, and these are the assertions I wish to write on my program. Uh, these assertions are true at the point where the flow goes through that particular statement. So this is the same program. Um, notice there's extra annotations here, apart from the fact that the variables are kept positive, which I dropped on the horse slides. Mm -hmm. There are assertions here about termination. And it's very interesting that Floyd, the earlier paper, did deal with termination. Um, and Hoare, who followed on from this piece of work, did not cover termination. So Floyd 67 is a really seminal paper. Uh, it was originally available in 1966. The paper is called Assigning Meaning to Programs. Um, it is fairly widely cited, but not very widely read. Uh, so a lot of people cite this because they've been told it's the origin of the work, but they don't go back and read it. And that's a real shame, in my opinion, because I think this paper is very interesting. It's not an easy read. Uh, when I was in the IBM Vienna laboratory, uh, back in the time when they were doing VDL, I'll talk about that later on, uh, we decided that we had enough difficulty understanding it, we would ask a logician to come and help us. Uh, and we asked Dana Scott, uh, one of the uh, most famous logicians in the subsequent story on semantics, to come and help us. And he was useless. He came and delivered a completely new paper on his own ideas and didn't help us at all with Floyd's papers. In fact, I had made a trip to uh, what was then called Carnegie Tech, subsequently Carnegie Mellon University, to talk to Bob Floyd about this paper in 1967. And that's one of the things that Jim King managed to sort out for me. Um, I was unsure about the date I went, and, and he pinned it down. Uh, an amusing thing about that trip, uh, Carnegie Tech was an IBM customer, um, so I had to have a minder go with me. Although I worked for IBM, I worked for another part of IBM, and I had to have the IBM Applied Science rep go with me. It was Ted Codd, the founder of Relational Databases. But this was before he had thought about Relational Databases, but Ted was an, an extremely interesting guy to go along with. Um, there's lots of interesting things in this paper of uh, Floyd's. Uh, he has meta rules that say certain properties of axioms should be true, and these can be thought of as healthiness conditions that Dijkstra invented many years later. He deals with termination, which I already pointed out on the figure. Um, and now we come to this assignment rule. When I showed the first instance of the Hoare axiom, I skipped over assignment because there's actually in an interesting historical technical story about assignment. So in Bob Floyd's original paper, he has a horrible version of the assignment axiom. He says, if you want to know x gets some function of f, some function f of x and y, so the right-hand side of this assignment can include x, then 
if you know the relation between x and y beforehand, afterwards you know there exists an x naught such that x equals that function of x naught and this relation holds between x naught and y. It's not an easy rule to use, I promise you. It's called the forward assignment rule. And what Hoare uses is the backward assignment rule, which is delightful. It says if you want to know P as the post condition, then you just substitute E for X throughout P, and that's the weakest precondition. That's a precondition which would assure that you get to P at the end. That's a much easier rule to use. The question is, the question I had at one time was, did Tony Hoare invent this rule? Because it's not the, it's not the rule used in Floyd's paper. And the answer is no, it was actually Bob Floyd who invented it, uh, and this was borne out by Jim King. And how did Tony Hoare hear about it? Well, I'll, I'll point out in a few minutes how Tony first read Floyd's paper, uh, but it wasn't in Floyd's paper. And the answer was David Cooper, uh, a very well-known English computer scientist at one time, was in Swansea University and had Robin Milner as his, as his postdoc. Uh, David Cooper had been in uh, Pittsburgh at Carnegie and had gone from working with Bob Floyd and gave a seminar in Belfast where at the time Tony Hall was professor of computing in Belfast. So Cooper is the person who took this important simplified assignment rule to Tony. I said uh, there were three real precursors of immediate precursors of Tony's paper. Another one was by Peter Nauer um, Peter now sadly died very recently, uh, but Peter had an idea which he called general snapshots, which if you look at it, has the same idea of assertions, but they're not written as logical expressions, they're written in English. So, uh, comment, um, A sub R is the greatest among the elements of, and so on. So, Peter now felt that English was an adequate language in order to be able to write down these assertions. My feeling about this paper, Proof of Algorithms by General Snapshots, is that it was not only less formal, it was less influential. And I'm not sure whether those two things are connected or not. Um, certainly you see very few citations to Peter Nauer's article. I think it's a shame because I think it was uh, what Peter Nauer saw as one tool that every programmer should have. Peter Nauer wrote a brilliant paper where he actually kept trace of every mistaken step he made in a program development. So he didn't think everything should be done with verification. But, but Peter's idea was that everybody should also know about these assertions. And he wrote a very nice book, Con Concise Survey of Computer Methods in 1974, where he explains this as just one of the ideas that programmers should know about. Um, I think I'll leave out the disagreement with Nauer. The third thing that Tony Hoare cites, and the third clear influence on him, is a paper by Van Weingarten, Ard Van Weingarten, the, uh, probably the father of Dutch computer science. And what Van Weingarten, who knew numerical analysis terribly well, observed was computers don't do perfect arithmetic. Computer arithmetic overflows, so you can't assume x plus 1 is greater than 1. And Van Weingarten wrote out a, a series of axioms of uh, computer, ultimately computer arithmetic. He first showed the ones of normal arithmetic which survive, uh, but, but then wrote out the ones for computer arithmetic. And these axioms of computer arithmetic are not only acknowledged in Hoare's 69 paper, they're actually taken over. So we've now got a nice compact little part of our confused cloud. We've got Floyd, 67, the main influence on Hoare's paper. Now 66, acknowledged but probably less obviously connected because of the lack of formalism. And Hoare does use the axioms of ar computer arithmetic, so that's also in Hoare's paper. Interesting question, which I've discussed with Tony Hoare uh, quite recently, in fact, 
uh, was how Tony Hoare came to know about Floyd's paper because it was not it was printed in the obscure in an obscure American conference and I think the answer to that is um, that Peter Lucas from the IBM lab Vienna where I worked for a long while uh, that Peter Lucas sent it to Tony Hoare so Tony Hoare gave a paper no he didn't give a paper Tony Hoare was at the famous formal definition conference in Baden by Wien in 1964 called Formal Language Description Languages and if I get to talk about semantics I'll talk a bit more about that book um, and at that he said I want a way of specifying programming languages that leave some things undefined that has a looseness about it so yes we want to pin down what our goal 60 means for example so that a compiler writer follows certain rules but no we don't want to specify every last bit because we may want for example expression evaluation to be done in arbitrary order so Tony was looking for that in 1964 I have a draft of his paper in 1967 where he's trying to write down an axiomatic semantics and to be polite about it it was not very well thought through um, it is nothing like the quality of his 1969 paper and Tony Hoare had been in uh, Vienna to hear about the IBM Vienna language definition techniques had spoken to Peter Lucas and Peter Lucas sent to Belfast uh, Floyd's paper and that was the crucial thing that let Hoare come up with this very clean very widely influential method so there's a nice compact bit of our diagram in the middle um, going back to my argument about tractability I think I don't want in any sense to diminish Hoare's uh, contribution over Floyd uh, Hoare's system is much more tractable it's much more usable than was that system of Floyd's but what came before Floyd? Did Floyd invent everything? And the answer is certainly no. Floyd makes a very generous acknowledgement to uh, Gorn and Perlis, and I'll show the quote for that acknowledgement in a few slides' time. Um, but even before Gorn and Perlis, it's worth going back to what I called the real founders of our subject, von Neumann von Neumann Architecture for Machines and Alan Turing who we've heard quite a lot about in the recent years and to look what they were doing so this is another sense in which I've revised my thinking here is a, a, a flowchart drawn in the Goldstein and von Neumann paper of 1947 so this is the, the famous uh, EDVAC report where he sets out what it means to build a stored program computer and it's a bit like a European community project report he throws everything into this including a little discussion about all the possible arcs you would want to ever draw in a flowchart but this is a flowchart with a form of assertion on it I have to say his description is extremely opaque uh, first time I tried to understand it I thought this was not an assertional technique and in comparison what I'm going to show you which is Alan Turing's work this is much much less clear but I have gone back and reread it under pressure from Jim King and I agree that there, there is the germ of the assertion idea already here the really fascinating paper is this one Alan Turing 1949 writes a paper called checking a large routine I'll show you enlargements of this in a minute the reason I put that unreadable one up is that's the entire paper three pages three full scat pages that funny size that, that lawyers use but that's the paper and when we look at it in detail as we will in the next few slides you'll see just how much there is in this paper so Alan Turing's handwriting was not very good I shouldn't say that because mine art isn't uh, but unfortunately he compounded it by using identifiers N, U, V and R uh, 
and if you've got bad handwriting those letters are almost indistinguishable and they were easily misread by the typist. His program has a doubly nested loop uh, and it's computing factorial. It's doubly nested because he doesn't assume he's got a multiply. So the outer loop is, is computing factorial, the inner loop is computing multiply for him. Um, he chose to write the factorial symbol which is a little box around the N instead of what, what most of us would write I think which is N exclamation mark. And then he failed to write the box in all the way through the text. Uh, it's there in the flowchart so we know what he intended but he forgot to write it in in the text. And there were how many? Ten further other significant typos in this paper. Uh, Lockwood Morris uh, about the time Kevin was in uh, Oxford, Lockwood Morris was there with me and together we exhumed this paper. We actually dug this paper up from uh, its near death and corrected all the typos and republished it in the Annals of Computer History. Um, and I'll show you the corrected version in a few minutes. So here's uh, Turing's doubly nested loop, an outer loop and an inner loop and he has letters on the uh, boxes and down here are the claims about the various values of variables. So here we've got uh, R factorial, I think it's R factorial, it looks like an R. Um, we could check by looking at our version later on. So why do I think this paper ought to have had real impact? Just remember the date, 1949, nearly 20 years before Tony Hoare's paper. First, there's a brilliant motivation that I use to this day when I'm, I'm talking to students about verification. That funny bit on the first page is actually a long addition. And Turing says, if you want to add these numbers together, and then check the sum. If I ask you to check it, you have to check all of the columns. But if I write down the carry digits, we can split that job between four, actually five people, we need to check the final sum, but we can split that job between five people. And what we have done with writing down the carry digits is to write down an assertion that breaks the problem into smaller parts. That's why Turing argued we should write assertions on flowcharts. I think that's absolutely brilliant motivation. Uh, I recommend you use it to your students if you're teaching verification. So that's one reason I think uh, it's an important contribution. Remember Hoare throws away the termination argument. He doesn't prove his programs terminate. Um, Floyd did. Turing did. And Turing did the termination argument in an extremely uh, interesting and witty way. Basically, this piece of the paper says, well, any mathematician would just use ordinal numbers in order to prove termination. But, since the computer only holds 2 to the power 40, it was a 40-digit word, we'll get away with 2 to the power 40 for our termination argument. But he documents a formal argument for why his loop terminates. So now we're beginning to get to the point where we can tie more of these papers together. Uh, and what I want to trace is whether there is any, uh, tr any influence from Turing's paper to Hoare's paper. So what evidence do we have? Well, uh, Hoare clearly, uh, uh, that's not what I thought it said. <laughs> the, Hoare's paper is extremely influential. I checked recently in Google and it's got over 5,000 citations, which is very unusual for a computer science paper. Hoare generously acknowledges uh, work from Floyd, Nauer and Van Weingarten. So we know that part of the story, we've already looked at it. Bob Floyd, assigning meaning to programs, far fewer citations, I think possibly uh, unjustly, uh, and I fear far fewer real readers. 
but it has many interesting things in it. And Freud writes, these modes of proof of correctness and termination are not original. They are based on ideas of Perlis and Gorn and may have had their earliest appearance in an unpublished paper by Gorn. I, I would give quite a lot of money to find that unpublished paper and I have tried, uh, but I haven't. Uh, this was one of the reasons I went to Jim King. Jim King was one of Bob Floyd's students at exactly the right time. Zoa Manor was another one. I've, uh, contact, I've sent a message to Zoa, but I haven't had a reply yet. Jim King says that before Floyd arrived at Pittsburgh, um, he went to a course by Alan Perlis and heard Alan Perlis actually talk about ideas of verification. So it really is true that there was something in the air in Pittsburgh before Bob Floyd wrote his paper. And as you see, uh, Floyd makes no attempt to, to hide this fact. He's very generous in his acknowledgement. Interestingly, Don Knuth dismisses this and says Floyd is just being too modest. Um, but I, I think we have to accept the evidence here. So Alan Turing, um, remember the famous Entscheidungsproblem paper, uh, the paper on which uh, his early reputation was based, um, is invented the Turing machine precisely to reason about programs. He wanted to prove you couldn't write a program which would check any program terminates, the Entscheidungsproblem, uh, but this 1936 notion of a Turing machine is there precisely to reason about programs. Turing 49 is a surprising paper. Clear motivation, program with doubly nested noops, has assertions, uh, and termination is handled. I think these two papers are the key part of my evidence for saying Program verification ideas have been there since the founding of our subject. And what we have had to do, what Hoare, for example, has made this fantastic contribution to, is finding tractable or easy to use ways of reasoning about programs. So this is from the Lockwood Morris paper, uh, Lockwood Morris and Cliff Jones paper, 84, where we exhumed uh, we exhumed the Turing paper and not only tidied up this diagram, we corrected all the typos in the text. That paper was, was given a, a conference in Cambridge to celebrate the world's second stored program computer. Uh, so the world's first stored program computer ran in Manchester the much-claimed EDSAC machine in Cambridge was actually the world's second machine. Uh, but in 1949, they held a conference to celebrate uh, the launch. Turing was invited to give a paper. Turing gave this paper that I've been praising so heavily. Who was at the conference? Well, not Tony Hoare. Tony Hoare was still in junior school. That's not an advance. I was looking at the uh, proceedings one of this conference one day and found that Van Weingarten was at the conference. Now, I can't prove that Van Weingarten heard the talk. I actually knew Art Van Weingarten quite well uh, when I used to teach for IBM in Brussels. I used to invite him as a guest. But I didn't discover this until after his death, so I could never ask him uh, why he had not talked about Alan Turing's paper. The intriguing thing is, Van Weingarten had the two pieces in his hand. He had the axioms of computer arithmetic, which Tony Hoare used, and he had Turing's result. He knew it, assuming he wasn't out punting that day, but, but assuming he actually heard Turing's paper, the conference he was at, he had the other part and could have done what Hoare did years later. But he didn't do it, and I have no idea why. I've asked other people who knew Van Weingarten even better, uh, who were close colleagues, and they never heard Van Weingarten talk about Turing's paper. So what impact did Turing's paper have? Obviously, 
Turing in 1949 knew about Turing machines and his 1936 paper. Um, it's clear because they cite it that Goldstein and von Neumann knew about Turing's 1936 paper. We've got over here Hoare 69. Is there a connection? If we go on, we've already established that Floyd, Now and Van Weingarten were influences on Hoare. We've already established that Perlis and Gorm were influences on Floyd. We know that there was a potential influence from Turing's paper to Van Weingarten because he was at the conference, but I have to say that I don't think that link really occurred and certainly didn't transmit through this paper which doesn't talk about this sort of assertion at all to Tony Hoare. So I have to claim that this Turing paper essentially had no influence on the subsequent research. A 20-year gap was wasted. We could have been doing Hoare-like reasoning uh, before I was in computing, uh, while I was still at school, uh, had, had that link have occurred. And that seems to me a, a great lost opportunity. We can now go and ask some other questions. Um, I bet Perlis and Gorn had read Goldstein and von Neumann because at the time it was the only paper in the world, well, maybe Turing's paper as well, but, but there were very, very few papers about what a computer was, so it's very unlikely they didn't read it. I don't know whether either of them ever worked with uh, von Neumann. It's interesting to conjecture whether, well, it's interesting to conjecture what passed between, Gold, uh, between Turing and von Neumann. We know that Turing went across the Atlantic during the war to discuss uh, machines for enciphering messages, not the crypto, crypto work he's famous for, not the enigma breaking, but they were trying to design a new coding machine that would code voice, and we know that that was the reason Turing went to the States during the, the time of the war. Uh, but because of the subject they were discussing, there is no public record of what they discussed. And, and I can find out nothing about this interchange. I know Hodges, who wrote the famous Turing biography, the definitive biography, and Hodges didn't manage to get any insight into this. So the final conclusion on this leg of the argument is that Turing's paper had no known impact. Writing history is actually a dangerous subject, uh, as I found out. After um, Lockwood Morris and I had published this reworking, uh, this correction of um, Floyd's paper, sorry, of Turing's paper, um, Morris Wilkes, uh, arguably one of the most famous computer scientists in the country at that time, wrote from Cambridge, not to Mo Lockwood Morris and I, but wrote to my PhD supervisor, Tony Hoare, uh, with a request that he might forward the letter to uh, the naughty boys, Lockwood Morris and Cliff Jones. Um, and he wrote, I would not like the idea to get around that Floyd's great idea had been anticipated by Turing. It has to be said that Wilkes and Turing didn't get on with one another. In fact, I think they had a mutual disrespect. Uh, both of them thought the other were, was not very heavyweight. Uh, and I sat there thinking, God, how do I reply to the great Professor Morris Wilkes uh, when we get a letter sent to my supervisor like that? And while I was still scratching my head, Lockwood Morris, who was a brilliant guy, uh, wrote a reply. Turing's grippingly interesting and gracefully written paper, uh, the paper's light is rather hidden under a bushel of some unfortunate number of typographical errors. We have no intention of making or marring any reputations. Not that Turing's or Floyd's could be in any danger from us. Full stop. And I thought that was just a masterful reply. Wilkes, go get lost. Um, and we didn't hear any more from Wilkes. Interestingly, Wilkes' letter contains another rather odd thing. His, Turing's approach, was what a few years later would have been described as a conventional one. 
That's a rather unusual uh, priority argument. <laughs> Later on, a lot of people were doing it, therefore Turing's work wasn't very important. Um, Wilkes was an interesting character. Okay, uh, where do we go after Hoare 69? Uh, there's, of course, an enormous history, which I'm not going to do anything like uh, credit to all of it. Um, Hoare wrote a, pro a paper which he called Proof of a Program Find. Uh, and this was sent to ACM referees. I was one of them. Uh, eventually publishing computer uh, communications to the ACM. And this paper was almost totally unreadable because it was a proof of a finished program. And while you can get away with that with successive uh, division by successive subtraction, it really does not work for a program the complexity of a sorting routine, which was what Tony Hall was trying to write. So I wrote back to the editor, John Reynolds at that time, uh, I don't feel I can referee this paper. I cannot check the proofs. And Tony had reached the same conclusion at about the same time, and he completely revised the paper uh, to be a top-down development of find. In typical Tony Hoare style, he forgot to change the title of the paper. He should have changed it to a formal development of FIND, but he didn't do that. Um, many years ago, I edited a series of Tony Hoare's papers for the Prentice Hall series, and this whole story is told, the book is called Essays, the full title will come at the end, Essays in Computing or something. And the full story is told there of the refereeing and so on. Another very important development is the ideas of data refinement, or as I always call it, data reification. This idea was invented by many people. Uh, Robin Milner, actually, I'll say a few more words about this. Robin Milner's was probably the first paper I knew about in this subject after I thought I'd invented it. Robin sent his paper on data refinement to the journal of the ACM, who rejected it as not being substantial enough idea to warrant publication in the JACM. Um, I believe data refinement is more important than the Hoare axioms. Uh, Tony and I both published papers on it about the same time, but if you look back at uh, many years earlier, Christopher Strachey wrote a development of a checkers playing program, a drafts playing program uh, for Scientific American and the idea of data refinement is actually already present even before Milner's paper uh, so that's an idea which had many comings. Um, I'll skip over that because I come to it in a minute. I want to talk about this uh, when I so the, the basis of the original material I'm doing is a, a long paper in the Annals of Computer History. Uh, when I published it, uh, Edsger Dijkstra wrote me a long objection or, uh, objecting letter saying that I had used Tony Hoare's paper as the key point of the argument and cited Tony Hoare's paper twice as many times as Edsger Dijkstra's paper and Dijkstra felt that was all wrong. Uh, Dijkstra did this refinement calculus. I could have taken it as the fulcrum, the, uh, the thing around which everything revolved. Uh, I still insist Hawes is a better guide. I actually have strong reservations about using the weakest precondition calculus as a program design idea, but that's more of a technical evaluation. So if you add up all these contributions, I think uh, they fit just on one slide. Goldstein and von Neumann certainly had some form of assertion boxes. Turing has very clear annotations, a termination argument, and this beautiful exposition, uh, as Lockwood Morris commented on it. Everybody else would say Floyd, but I think we now do have to say Perlis and Floyd. Uh, had the idea of annotating the program with a specific logic, with first order predicate calculus, uh, which makes the arguments much more formal. Zoa Manor comes up with uh, extensions of ideas about termination arguments. That's his thesis. 
Jim King builds the first verification system. Uh, he built one for his thesis, then he went to work at IBM San Jose Research and built another one called Effigy, and I actually used Effigy um, when I was with IBM and he was at another part of IBM. Uh, it would Floyd was certainly the supervisor of both Manor and King. Um, I think it's true to say that Bob Floyd had the original idea of building the verification system, but Jim King did the building. Van Weingarten came up with the axioms of computer numbers. Hoare brings all of these things together and has this nice axioms and rules uh, about program statements, but no termination argument, which I think is unfortunate. Hoare also then goes on to have this notion of development, Dijkstra, weakest preconditions, and the Vienna work um, made the, the, the switch over to post conditions as relations, which actually give you a much neater way of uh, proving termination, and the early VDM books are certainly the first books that take data abstraction and reification seriously. Uh, I have to make a choice now. I'll make the choice to do a little bit on semantics and skip over that slide. So the work I'm doing at the moment with a PhD student is to, alongside the annals paper, which is the history of verification, I want to try and produce a history of the semantics of programming languages, the way the semantics of programming languages are described. So what's going on in this area? Well, the Algol 60 report solved the problem of syntax description. Back as normal form or back as now form, uh, whichever you prefer for BNF, gave us a way of writing down the formal syntax of a programming language. It's been improved later. Um, there are still problems about ambiguity and efficiency of parsing, but essentially how to describe the syntax of a programming language was fixed in 1960s. Um, Heinz Zemanek, the boss of the Vienna lab, took over from Charles Sanders Peirce. This is not a typo. His name is actually Peirce, not Pierce. The uh, semiotics term. So semiotics is the study of languages. It consists of syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Um, the first attempt, probably, to write down the semantics of a programming language is now almost forgotten. Uh, but I was in touch with Mike Patterson just last week. Uh, there was some work going on on the equivalences between programs, and Luck and Park and Patterson were the key people involved in this. And I mention this because it brings us right up to date on semantics in a little while. The first major effort to define the semantics of programming languages was the so called operational semantics. Um, McCarthy used the term, I haven't put it on the slide, uh, John McCarthy used the term abstract interpreters. So you write an interpreter for the language you're trying to explain, but you write it in a mathematical as possible a notation. And the early semantics uh, were mainly operational. McCarthy uh, gave a talk at the Baden by Wien meeting in 1964 where he gives the operational semantics of what he calls micro-algol, so a very small subset of algol. The Vienna group um, went on and worked on the Vienna definition language. Uh, they didn't call it VDL, incidentally, that's Jan Lee's term, but worked on something that got called the Vienna definition language, which is an operational semantics notation. It's quite ugly in many ways, uh, and the story of the transition to VDM uh, is essentially trying to get away from this ugliness. But Plotkin, Gordon Plotkin, uh, cleared up many of the operational semantics ideas when he came up with structural operational semantics. So the S is often mispronounced, it's structural operational semantics. I love this quote from McCarthy, actually before the Baden by Wien conference. Um, expressing the hope that logic will really get the same role as uh, calculus and so on has done in earlier branches of uh, 
non-mathematical expo exploitation. The posh thing to do for many years was to work on denotational semantics. So operational semantics, give me a, a program, an abstract program, and some starting data, and my abstract interpreter will tell you what the final state is. Denotational semantics is more mathematical. It says, give me the program, and I will map it into a mathematical function from states to states. So I don't need the initial state, I map the program into a function from states to states. And this idea was really pioneered in, well I shouldn't say in Oxford, it was really pioneered by uh, Christopher Strachey and Peter Landin, and Peter Landin was never in Oxford. Uh, there were some important technical problems in the meaning of lambda calculus that Dana Scott, who I mentioned before, solved um, and the Vienna group uh, so let me see Hans Beckich had gone to work with Peter Landin in Queen Mary and picked up some of the denotational ideas Peter Lucas and I had tried to prove a theorem about the operational semantics and found it unnecessarily difficult so we too moved in parallel to denotational semantics and the Vienna development method uh, as well as being a method for developing programs uh, is built around the denotational semantics idea. Unfortunately, while operational semantics easily copes with concurrency, uh, domain theory, the, the mathematics underneath denotational semantics, gets very messy if you wish to deal with uh, concurrency. So we've got operational semantics, denotational semantics, and Many people will argue that Hoare's axioms, which we spent a lot of the talk looking at, that Hoare's axioms provide an axiomatic semantics for programming languages. Um, um, we've talked about that. Uh, Peter Lauer from the Vienna Lab went to work with Tony Hoare in Belfast when he was still in Belfast um, and made a link between operational semantics and axiomatic semantics, essentially proving the axioms were consistent with a model. The reason I wanted to talk about this uh, is that Tony Hoare now essentially dismisses this work. His most famous paper by far, he says he really missed the right way of doing it in 1969. And what Tony is working on now is a much more algebraic approach KA stands for clean A algebras and CKA is for concurrent clean A algebras and um, Tony now has an idea which is much closer to the original Patterson or Luck and Park Patterson equivalence idea. So in a sense the circle has gone all the way back to the idea of stating semantics by the equivalence between programs. Um, I've recently had the privilege of uh, interviewing Tony Hoare because he won the Turing Prize the ACM is trying to collect videos of all of the remaining alive uh, video uh, remaining alive Turing Award winners and I made the video of Tony in his home in Cambridge uh, and I get Tony to talk about this relationship between his earlier axiomatic work and concurrent clean air algebras um, in that video. And most people who are doing operational semantic, most people who are teaching semantics I think now teach operational semantics, certainly I do. Um, so here's what we're, this is the last substantive slide, um, here's what we're really working on now. Uh, Peter Mosses in Swansea had a project called Programming Languages and computer systems. Um, I got involved in Peter's project and contributed a lot of historical stuff which I've tried to put up on my web pages um, including the complete copy of these wonderful proceedings from the Baden by Wien conference. Um, Elsevier no longer print the book. I tried to get permission from them to put it up on the web and they never replied to my letters, so I've put it up on the web and I'm waiting for them to come and lock me away. 
uh, but I put it up with a notice that I'm prepared to take it down if they will put it up. Um, with my uh, PhD student, Troy Astarte, uh, we're currently looking at at least four ALGOL 60 descriptions in different styles, uh, and we're calling this paper an exegesis, an analysis of the text of these four definitions, because having had ALGOL 60 defined by four different groups, you can really pull apart the differences between these methods. Um, Troy has only just started this, uh, this academic year that we're in now, so this is the first reference to his thesis, which is unlikely to be ready for another couple of years. Um, my last plug, um, this year is the 100th anniversary of Christopher Strachey's birth. Um, I think Strachey was brilliant, he did many things, he published far too little. What he did publish was good, but, but he published far too little. So we're planning a, a meeting in uh, Oxford uh, the weekend after his birthday, actually. So th this is a Saturday, and we'll probably run over into the Sunday. Anyone interested in the history subject, watch out for notices. I'm going to Cambridge, ne uh, going to Oxford next week to fix up details of this, so the announcement of the meeting should appear soon after that. Right, um, that's my annals paper which has the body of the, ma the material from the body of the lecture, uh, this technical report, I had a brilliant librarian working with me who collected all the references, this book by Donald Mackenzie, Donald is now a serious sociologist but went and interviewed all the key people working on verification and wrote what I regard to be a brilliant piece of sociology. He really got behind the minds of uh, what it means for a mathematician to prove a theorem and what it means for a computer scientist uh, to prove a result about a program. Um, the best reference on the early Vienna work is this paper by Peter Lucas and Kurt Valk. Gordon Plotkin's notes from 1981 uh, were always very hard to get hold of, but fortunately they were reprinted in the Journal of Logic and Algebraic Programming in 2014. So uh, this paper, sorry, this is actually the companion paper. In the same edition of the Journal of Logic and Algebraic Programming, they reprint Plotkin's notes from 81, and this paper discusses them. And I wrote a similar paper at the same time. Uh, Gordon and I were swapping notes to try and get the uh, histories of the two pieces of work on operational semantics consistent with one another. So, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>